Well, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. I'm David Fitzgerald. I co-direct the Center for Comparative Immigration Studies, which is co-hosting today's event, along with our friends at the UCLA Center for the Study of International Migration. Uh, every Friday, we're having book seminars this quarter. You can find information on all of our activities at the websites of both centers. Next Friday, at the same time, we'll be hosting uh, Richard Alba, with commentary by Susan Brown to discuss Alba's new book, uh, The Great Demographic Illusion, Majority Minority and the Expanding American Mainstream. Uh, but today we're fortunate to welcome Alan Colburn and Karthik Ramakrishnan to discuss Citizenship Reimagined, a new framework for state rights in the United States. Alan is Assistant Professor of Political Science at Arizona State University. He's a former visiting fellow at CCIS. So welcome back virtually, Alan. And uh, Karthik Ramakrishnan is Professor of Public Policy and Political Science at UC Riverside. Our discussant today is Kirk Bensack. He is Assistant Professor of Political Science at UC San Diego. So the order today is that uh, the two authors will give a brief overview of their work for about 30 minutes. Uh, then we'll have a 10 minute comment from Kirk. We'll kick it back to the authors for uh, a quick reaction and then open up the discussion to everyone participating today. Um, if you have a question, you may use the uh, Q&A function at the bottom of your screen or simply electronically raise your hand and you'll be invited in to pose the question directly to the authors. So without further ado, please help me welcome um, Alan and, uh, and Karthik. The floor is yours. Thank you, David. And Alan, if you could um, do the screen share. Excellent. Um, so thank you so much uh, for uh, welcoming us here. And many of the ideas, uh, I would say, are ideas that Alan and I have been developing over the years. And uh, folks at CCIS uh, and elsewhere have been critical um, to helping shape these ideas over time. Of course, the standard caveats, we alone are responsible for <laughs> any, any, of, any of the things we're about to say, but we really are grateful for a community of uh, of, of scholars and colleagues who've uh, helped along the way. Uh, next slide. So state rights, uh, it, is, it is provocative uh, the way we had the subtitle uh, of our book. Uh, when people think about state rights, when they think about states and rights, it's usually, it's not a pretty picture, right? If you look at the long history of slavery and then Jim Crow, and now, um, you know, just a week after what Georgia did, uh, in terms of restricting voter rights under the image of a plantation with a bunch of white males signing away um, political rights to an entire uh, entire groups of people, at least in terms of what the uh, what the likely effect will be, it's it's not uh, it's not encouraging. So when we think about federalism in the context of rights, it generally has been images as well as policies that have removed rights for people of color and other disenfranchised groups. Next slide. But that's not the only story when it comes to federalism um, and rights. We look at women's suffrage. Just last year, we celebrated the centennial of, uh, of the women's right to vote across the country. But we need to remember that well before that, you had expansion in, uh, in women's voting rights, first at the local level, and then across several Western states before it spread to the East Coast and then ultimately became, uh, became part of the US Constitution. Next slide. More recently, we can, we can look at marriage rights and how expansion in marriage rights uh, occurred because of our structure of federalism, enabling expansion of rights at the state level that then ultimately got ratified uh, by the US Supreme Court. Next slide. So generally we want to think about federalism, at least having the potential here of that ideal that Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis had articulated a long time ago, uh, where a state may, if its citizens choose, serve as a laboratory and to try novel social and economic experiments without risk to the rest of the country. Next slide. Now, the story of empowering states is not always uh, a progressive one, right? And we've defined progressive state citizenship actually in a quite a narrow way. What you see in the slide is essentially if you had to summarize 
chapter two of our book and maybe even the entire book. <laughs> you know, this book has a lot in it. Um, but if you had to leave with one composite image, it would be this, to think of citizenship as multidimensional and multi-level, and also to think about the relational nature between federal citizenship and state citizenship. Next slide. So first, you know, lest some people may argue that we have, we're putting up a straw man or a straw person only to tear it down. But this notion of citizenship as unidimensional and binary is something that is still quite strong. Maybe not in sociology, maybe a little bit less so in political science, but this is very strong in legal scholarship. So when Alan and I have presented this to audiences that include law professors and practitioners of the law, for them, it's pretty cut and dried in terms of who is a citizen and who is not. And it, and it, and it's around this notion of legal status, of legal status as the factor, the category that controls access to a whole bunch of political, social, and civic rights. And we see this in the literature more generally on citizenship, from Chuck Tilley to Rogers Brubaker and Peter Schuck to others. So in this visioning, citizenship is exclusive to the national level, and it's a litmus test. Either you have, either you have legal status or you don't. No legal status, the implication goes no citizenship. Legal status means you do have access to citizenship and it's a pretty powerful argument. If you look at what California has done, for example, and what we say is a regime of progressive state citizenship, you still have the US government through border patrol and ICE able to detain and deport anyone it chooses, well, in compliance with federal law. So there's a limit to what states can do with respect to its citizens. So this is something we have to take very seriously in terms of what citizenship ultimately may mean. And maybe that is the kind of gold standard of citizenship, if you will. Next slide. Now, in response to that kind of unidimensional notion of citizenship as tied to legal status, you've had a rich literature in the social sciences that talk about citizenship as multidimensional. Um, and to go beyond legal status, where they show that you can that communities can exercise political, social, and civic rights without needing to have um, federal legal status. They also talk about citizenship as participation in society, so citizenship as a kind of exercise, the practice of citizenship, if you will. That's or citizenship as practice, and then finally, citizenship as a sense of belonging. Now, this is in the tradition of T.H. Marshall of citizenship as having multiple dimensions. And you see authors like Elizabeth Cohen, Irene Bluebrad, and others in this tradition. Irene Bluebrad uh, extends it further as this notion of partial citizenship as opposed to full citizenship uh, with potentially different dimensions in mind. You also have a robust literature when it comes to urban citizenship, global citizenship. Uh, that, that, that talks about citizenship as potentially occurring at multiple levels, but in, includes many of these different concepts lumped together. So what Alan and I tried to do, and here relying heavily on Alan's strength and background in political theory and the work we've both done drawing and getting inspired by the comparative politics literature in democracy is to create a systematized concept of citizenship that is akin to what we've seen in the democracy literature in comparative politics. Next slide. Oh, so one more slide. I, I think I got ahead. Okay. So our definition of citizenship is quite simple, but it's complicated, or at least it, it took a lot of work. I was just telling this, teaching this to my class this past week. And I said, you know, we, we take about 30 pages to elaborate this very simple sentence here. <laughs> right? And they, and they laughed. Um, so this is, uh, this is our definition of citizenship. And if you can go to the next animation there, uh, Alan. So we say that citizenship is the provision of rights both by a political jurisdiction to its members. So fundamentally, it is about membership. It's about political jurisdictions. And it's about the provision of rights. Now, there are other definitions of citizenship. Uh, we, we don't say that ours is superior to any of those. But we want to ground it in rights. Because the standard critique of those multidimensional conceptions of citizenship is that they are weaker. The conventional notion is 
is very elegant and it's grounded in rights and people talking about citizenship as practice, citizenship as a sense of belonging, ultimately cannot answer that question of citizenship as controlling access to rights. So we didn't want to cede that ground and we want to really innovate here in thinking about citizenship as multidimensional while still remaining firmly in the framework of rights and the provision of rights by jurisdictions as opposed to natural rights, right? God-given rights as it were. Um, that, that is just fundamental human rights that, that has nothing to do with the ability of a jurisdiction to provide those rights. Next slide. So if, you, uh, if you've observed the, the literature, the democracy literature has been, it's been exciting, but maybe for some people a little too complicated in terms of how concepts get systematized. Uh, this, this draws on the work of uh, David Collier and a bunch of other colleagues that talk about conceptual hierarchies. And so we can think of the root concept either as membership or as citizenship, and then go up and down the ladder of abstraction to, uh, to talk about um, different aspects of this, this uh, core concept, right? So if you start off with the root concept of either membership or say political membership, you can keep going up to each level of overarching concept to get to citizen. And then we consider national citizenship and state citizenship as classical subtypes of, um, of, um, of the root concept of citizenship. Actually, I should say, yeah, you start a political membership and go down to different subtypes, or you can start with citizenship and go up in terms of overarching concepts to get to political membership and then ultimately the membership. Next slide. So there's a lot here if you look at our book in terms of these conceptual charts. Just quickly, if you go from membership to political membership, political membership is one of several types of membership that, that people could hold, right? So they could have membership in racial and ethnic communities, religious communities, diasporic communities, or even outside of politics, you know, in terms of sports and entertainment fan base. Now people might laugh, but you see, I see flags for Steelers, through, you know, no matter where you are in the country, people will hold up these, these symbols, uh, right, of their political membership. And there have been cases of people killing and dying uh, uh, with respect to disputes over, uh, over sports fandom. Um, next slide. So going down one level, so it's not only is it membership, but it's a particular kind of membership, it's political membership, but it's not just any kind of political membership because you can have party membership and interest group membership that is not grounded in jurisdictions. So it's grounded in jurisdictions and below that it, it's, it's grounded in rights, right? So you can have other kinds of citizens, uh, other kinds of um, political membership that is based on participation, based on representation, based on uh, power or based on identity. And we provide examples of what you would call um, exa all of those different examples of those classical subtypes. Next slide. Now, some people may say that state citizenship is a partial citizenship and not a whole citizenship, but we argue otherwise. We say that it is possible to talk about semi-citizenship like Elizabeth Cohen does, but to talk about it either at the national level or at the state level or even at the local level, right? That is how partial or full you are on those different dimensions of rights. It has nothing to do with jurisdiction. Jurisdiction, we argue, is part of that kind hierarchy so that national citizenship, state citizenship, local citizenship, or say global citizenship would be subtypes of citizenship. Next slide. So what do we consider citizenship? We consider citizenship as the right uh, to one of five dimensions. First dimension is the right to free movement, and this uh, builds entirely on Alan's dissertation and forthcoming book on runaway slaves and its comparison to undocumented immigrants today. Maybe put cheekily, you have the Southwest ad, you are free to move about the country. Well, that is more true for some groups than for others. And this includes not only immigrants who may be subject to, uh, to uh, search by border patrol as well as ICE, but also to black people and others who are routinely stopped by law enforcement as they go about their business. Second dimension that we, uh, that we flag is the right to due process and legal protection. Uh, it's fairly standard. I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about that. Third, the right to develop human capital. Now, this is something that is an innovation in our book, and it's a pretty significant one. 
We've had Supreme Court cases that have upheld the right to a K through 12 education. You have congressional law that established the right for any person to access emergency rooms. But what do these rights represent? We argue that these represent the right to develop human capital, the fundamental building blocks that people need to thrive. Fourth dimension, the right to participate and be represented. So we can talk about right to participation in terms of voting rights. Uh, it could be other types of participation rights as well, including providing public comment to rule changes. You also have the right to representation. The Trump administration tried to take away the right to representation through its apportionment process, but the Biden administration has, uh, has overruled it through its executive order. But that is a way that people who, any person could be represented and you don't have to be a US citizen to be represented in Congress. And then finally, the right to identify and belong. We provide examples like removing all mentions of the word alien in California's code, but also other examples like for driver's licenses for transgender people. Having official documents that don't force you to choose between male and female is part of that right to identify and belong. Next slide. So importantly, state citizenship can exceed federal standards of non-citizen rights, uh, and it's structured by broader federalism dynamics of the US Constitution, courts, Congress, parties, and movements, and Alan will talk more about that. Um, and so it can be this multi-layered cake, but of course, there's a lot of potential for conflict here, and that's a major part of our book. Next slide. So citizenship in that federalism framework, we argue can be progressive, meaning that it expands rights above those provided at the federal level, or establish state level protected classes in the absence or silence when it comes to federal rights, and we have examples there. There's also regressive state citizenship, right? With what many Jim Crow states did uh, after the Civil War, what states like Arizona uh, do routinely with respect to immigrant rights, uh, where they restrict or erode rights that are supposed to be guaranteed at the federal level, or when the federal government is uh, silent to establish state level pariah classes um, that, take, that remove rights that might otherwise be provided in the absence of legislation. And then finally, reinforcing citizenship. Reinforcing citizenship are instances where states use US citizenship as a basis to either include or to exclude. So for example, state driver's license requirements in most states that don't affirmatively allow those without federal legal status to obtain driver's licenses are reinforcing federal law, when it, federal immigrant, uh, federal citizenship status when it comes to access to state benefits. And there are other examples on the exclusionary side. Uh, on the inclusionary side, state anti-discrimination laws that reinforce federal rules would be an example of reinforcing state citizenship that is in an inclusionary direction. So I think, Alan, I turn it over to you now. Great, so I'm gonna uh, kind of move into the rest of the book. Um, so we have chapter two that lays out much of what uh, Karthik was just speaking about, our conceptual framework of federated citizenship and kind of how we get to the multidimensional uh, understanding of state citizenship. Uh, and so throughout the book, we uh, unpack and apply our concept of state citizenship and the three different types that Karthik had laid out there uh, to understand both the African-American experience of citizenship in terms of citizenship rights, and then also the immigrant experience of citizenship rights. And so we look throughout American history and we develop a, an APD or an American political development framework uh, to explain uh, different developments in the different types of citizenship at the state level that we see emerging. Um, and so to explain uh, the development of state citizenship, we argue uh, that uh, national citizenship uh, looms large in the background uh, of, uh, in providing a, an existing baseline of rights. Uh, so during the antebellum era uh, for African-Americans, uh, they were denied national citizenship. Uh, they were effectively denied from having uh, many federal rights. And so the baseline there uh, was non-existent, allowing slavery to emerge throughout the South and allowing uh, near uh, kind of slavery restrictive laws to emerge in the North. Um, and so this constitutional uh, background uh, lays the foundations for uh, state citizenship to emerge in different ways throughout American history. Um, 
as the Constitution uh, develops, so thinking about the 14th and 15th Amendment uh, in particular, uh, we see uh, changes in the way that state citizenship looks, uh, especially for African Americans. Um, but we say that still, and we see similar patterns with constitu constitutional developments in terms of uh, uh, preemption over federal immigration law uh, and the changing dynamics that happens uh, with state uh, restrictions or progress on, on undocumented immigrant rights. Uh, building on top of this constitutional framework, uh, we argue that uh, you know, the legislative actions and executive actions at the national level uh, really set the foundation uh, for what states can do. Uh, and then within states, uh, we argue that social movement building and, and building a coalition with uh, uh, allies in state legislature uh, are key to explaining what is happening at the state level. So I'm gonna go through and just kind of highlight how we apply our conceptual framework mostly uh, to uh, the African-American experience historically uh, and today, and then also briefly conclude with the immigrant experience. Um, so as Karthik laid out, uh, we have three different subtypes, but the two that really emerge in the antebellum era, so before the 14th Amendment uh, nationalizes uh, citizenship for African-Americans, uh, we saw a restrictive version of state citizenship emerging. Uh, and then we also saw a progressive version emerging. Um, so the restrictive version actually reinforced federal restrictions. Uh, since the federal government did not provide uh, rights, rights to uh, national citizenship or other types of rights along our framework, um, Blacks essentially uh, were reliant on what state and local governments were doing uh, in restricting or expanding their rights. Um, and so in the South, we had uh, states expanding on this kind of restrictive federal environment, uh, creating a kind of robust system of slavery laws. And in the North, we see uh, some states uh, moving in a similar direction uh, in enforcing federal fugitive slave law uh, with, at the state level uh, to redeem and recapture and, and send back runaway slaves to Southern slavery. Uh, but we also see resistance to this uh, in the North uh, and we see a range of kind of abolitionist led states uh, who uh, fought to protect the rights of not only free blacks, but also runaway slaves. Um, and so we see this across and we kind of map this out throughout, throughout uh, chapter uh, four of our book, where we highlight the different dimensions, both in the restrictive and the progressive sides of state citizenship that emerged before the 14th amendment. Um, for example, uh, the right to free movement dimension one, uh, there are a range of laws throughout states that, that uh, regulate the interstate entry and also the international entry of Blacks. Uh, there are different laws requiring manumission papers and slave passes and tags uh, to regulate the movement of both runaway slaves or slaves, uh, as well as free Blacks. And this is occurring both in the North and in the South. Um, we see sunset curfew laws and vagrancy laws. Uh, and other types of restrictions on the mobility or movement of, of free Blacks and enslaved Blacks. Um, dimension two of our framework, due process and legal protection. Uh, here we see uh, states uh, either building on top of uh, the restrictive federal baseline uh, to enforce federal fugitive slave law or to enact and enforce their own state fugitive slave laws and anti-harboring laws. Uh, so these laws essentially uh, would track down uh, runaway slaves in the North and return them back to Southern slavery. Um, we also saw uh, states leading in uh, removal campaigns to remove free Blacks and, and, and other uh, Blacks of status, of different statuses uh, from the country or from their, from their own borders. Uh, and then in opposite, opposition to this, we saw uh, Northern states like Pennsylvania and Massachusetts in particular who enacted a range of personal liberty laws uh, that look very similar to today's sanctuary policies uh, regarding undocumented immigrants. So these laws uh, not only, uh, re or not only uh, severed the connection between fugitive slave laws and what the state and local governments and officials were doing, um, they also provided and expanded new rights to uh, court access, uh, other types of protections under state law and by state officials and local officials. We also saw uh, a range of other types of rights uh, emerging, both restrictive and progressive uh, throughout the antebellum era. Uh, so I'll briefly just highlight dimension four here, the right to vote. Uh, states uh, like Massachusetts and New York allowed free blacks and also runaway slaves to vote 
uh, in, uh, in their elections. Um, and so this is prior to even having national citizenship. So I wanna transition then. So after the 14th Amendment and it uh, establishes a kind of constitutional right to, to citizenship for African-Americans, uh, we still see state citizenship as being essential uh, to, uh, to black rights. Um, and so we saw along all five of our dimensions, uh, the right to free movement, due process, legal protection, the right to develop human capital, uh, the right to participate and be represented and the right to identify and belong. On all of these different dimensions, we see after uh, the federal government uh, ends reconstruction, these emerge uh, in, in what we would call uh, Jim Crow. Um, and so we not only saw kind of a, 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 a big movement from 1965 or 1865 to 1875, where progress was being made at the state level. Um, once the federal government left uh, the South uh, and enabled white supremacy and, and a democratic take, takeover of Southern states, uh, we saw a return to kind of restriction. Um, but we call this under our framework, regressive state citizenship, because at the federal level, we do have uh, both the constitutional right to citizenship uh, and a range of other civil rights laws that had been enacted throughout Re Reconstruction. Uh, and so we see the South essentially regressing these rights that were supposed to be secured at the national level, uh, leading to kind of really robust Jim Crow uh, type state regressive regimes. Um, so I'm gonna briefly transition just for time. Uh, and importantly, uh, in thinking about uh, our framework uh, applying to the immigrant experience, um, I think that this really highlights the, the, the ways in which uh, focusing on just citizenship rights and disconnecting this from the idea of legal status at the national level uh, is important moving forward. Uh, it allows us to think about uh, the ways in which the African-American experience with citizenship rights uh, can, can relate to uh, what is happening with immigrant rights uh, today. Uh, it also highlights the, the importance where uh, these rights uh, aren't, uh, they don't have to be tied to, to legal status at the federal level. Uh, in fact, voting rights and other types of rights can develop uh, on their own at the state and federal level, uh, separate from legal status. Uh, and so we briefly, uh, for the immigrant experience in California, uh, when, when California was founded in 1850, um, it had immediately enacted a range of regressive laws uh, restricting uh, essentially all five dimensions uh, of rights for different groups. Uh, now this uh, was applied immediately for Blacks and Native Americans, uh, but as we saw the immigrant population grow in California, particularly the Chinese uh, immigrant population, and then later the Mexican immigrant population, uh, we saw a range of, of laws being enacted to uh, regress their rights as well, uh, especially uh, with the 1879 Constitution in California. Uh, so this spans all five dimensions of our framework. Um, and in our chapter on California, we highlight this history and talk about uh, kind of how, or how we uh, not only have this uh, regressive state citizenship passed, uh, but also how we uh, moved forward and develop a, a progressive state citizenship. Um, and so briefly, uh, in the 1990s, and in response to Prop 187, uh, and a range of other factors happening, uh, the immigrant rights movement started to build. Uh, we also saw an increased uh, role uh, of, of Latino elected officials uh, emerging. And, and slowly, California started to build up a capacity to push for state policies, despite uh, all of the restrictions that were happening at the federal level. Um, and so we see this progressive state citizenship emerge, um, providing in-state tuition and, and, and other benefits for education, uh, providing driver's licenses to undocumented immigrants, uh, providing health care uh, to some of our undocumented re residents, uh, to robust sanctuary protections that sever uh, immigration enforcement at the state and local level, uh, and also expand the rights to things like uh, legal protection or legal uh, defense uh, in de deportation cases. Um, more recently, we saw in 2015, California uh, struck the, the, the term alien from its uh, labor code. Um, and so this we would highlight as dimension five in our framework. And we argue that 2015 was the moment 
uh, when California actually uh, kind of compiled uh, enough policies and, and expansions and rights to, uh, to be considered a full state citizenship in, in the progressive sense. Uh, so here uh, we argue that once you have enough of each of these dimensions, uh, we then call it not just a partial, but now a full state citizenship. Um, one that kind of stands alone and in parallel to uh, what is happening at the federal level uh, and the denial of national citizenship. So I'm gonna hand it over to Karth to wrap up. Thank you, Alan. So in terms of future directions and state citizenship, I'll be quick here, next slide. You know, a little bit of, uh, uh, I just wanna just say how kind of, how fulfilling it's been not only to do this work over uh, over five years, I mean, now when I look at the dateline there, it's six years, um, right, to from start to finish. When Alan and I first started this, it was on the heels of me finishing up work with uh, Prithi Pangula Sekram on the new immigrant federalism. And Alan really wanted to, he thought there was something really important going on in California and other states using this kind of citizenship frame. And so the work we did uh, at the policy school from a policy brief, essentially helped structure and frame up uh, a front page New York, LA Times story, right? Um, of, uh, of a kind of a state citizenship that is taking shape uh, and, and pointing to instances like erasing alien from the labor code as, a, as an important step. Next slide. More recently, uh, when you look at California law, uh, this is a bill that was signed by Governor Gavin Newsom in 2019 um, by Senator DeRosso, sponsored by Senator DeRosso. And the title is Citizens of the State, right? And something worth reading in, in, the, in the kind of preamble where this bill would instead provide that citizens of the state are all persons born in the state and residing in it, except the children of alien public ministers. So, you know, they actually put that word alien back in after they took it out in 2015. Um, and consuls and all persons born out of the state who are citizens of the United States and residing within the state, right? So this is pretty powerful to see this kind of a concept getting enshrined in state law. And this was in relation to a bill that allows um, anyone, regardless of their federal citizenship status, to serve on appointed boards and commissions as long as it does not violate US labor law. Next slide. Now looking ahead, we can think about um, other potential expansions in, in state citizenship, but, but uh, contractions as well. So for example, the right to develop human capital, is there an immigrant right to health care? You know, we still don't see that, um, right? Um, that's still a limitation of the Affordable Care Act. Um, immigrant work authorization, states are not able to uh, allow work authorization. Uh, to their residents. So, so undocumented folks have to come up with all sorts of workarounds in order to be able to participate in the economy. Uh, heartland visas, right? It's something that Pete Buttigieg, when he was a candidate, had touted. Um, we'll see where, where that goes, um, you know, in terms of allowing states either to issue visas themselves or like in the case of Canada, a kind of point system where they are able to add preferential points. Dimension four, um, right to participate and be represented. We can, we've seen contractions in voting rights in many states and attempts to expand them in municipalities like um, San Francisco. Um, will we see uh, back, a return back to the mid 1800s to early 1900s where white non-US citizens had the right to vote, uh, not only for state offices, but federal office? And probably not anytime soon, but it shows you what is constitutionally permissible uh, in the United States. Um, and then we'll see what happens when it comes to redistricting, um, where um, certainly states like Texas have in the past tried to exclude non-US citizens from, the, from uh, redistricting to say that it's not the principle of one person, one vote, but one citizen, one vote. So we'll leave it at that and look forward to your engagement uh, today. Thank you very much, Karthik and Alan. Um, Kirk. Hi, so uh, Alan and Karthik, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. And even more so, I really enjoyed the book. I mean, this is, uh, by from where I stand, an incredibly ambitious undertaking um, and a really uh, impressive result. I really enjoyed the book. 
Um, and so it's exciting and it makes me happy that I have a chance to comment on it. Um, what it makes me less happy and excited is I have to do this in about uh, 10 minutes because I don't think I can, I can do justice to it. Um, but what I wanted to start out um, by focusing on is just one thing that I really, at a very high level, really enjoyed about the book. And then I'll segue to some, to some comments that are not meant to be either um, kind of things that I, that I like or critiques, but ideas for potential extensions and, and spin-offs that might be of interest to, to you two or to people in the audience. Uh, and so uh, to begin, uh, the thing that I really, really liked about the book uh, and that you touched on a bit in the beginning of the presentation was uh, the framework, the conceptual framework. There's really an incredible amount of theoretical richness uh, that I thought that um, instead of getting in the way of actually aided in understanding the real world. And I think, you know, one of the, at least uh, by my read of the book, one of the things that you were trying to do is, is um, come up with a way to provide conceptual simplification without engaging in, in what you call conceptual stretching. And I think you succeeded 100% in that, in that regard. And uh, just to sort of reiterate something you've already said and to describe what, I, what I'm talking about, the, the fact that you've used this sort of rights-based framework that's already present, obviously in a more restrictive form, in the dominant national model of citizenship, but used that to extend it to highlight state citizenship, uh, I thought played really well. Uh, it, it allowed you to anchor everything to a rights-based framework that was not only conceptually succinct, but also institutionally backed through US federalism, constitutional frameworks, concrete legal and bureaucratic processes, real things going on in the world. Um, so it's, it's citizenship reimagined, obviously, um, but on the basis of things that are not imaginary at all, things that are very real and concrete. And actually where I, one of the ways in which I've found this to be most evident um, was uh, along the lines of something that I was initially at, at a superficial level when I just saw the term most skeptical about, which was in the final dimension of rights to identify and belong. Because this is, it's here where one I think would at first pass, at least you know, very superficial first pass, just reading that phrase, I think there would be the greatest risk of conceptual stretching and yet, you clearly and compellingly situate that dimension as well within a concrete rights-based perspective and operationalize it with real things that are happening in the world. Uh, so, uh, but by my count, the end result was a, a conceptual framework that simultaneously offered a clear and organizing framework for understanding the world while at the same time uh, actually describing what's actually happening in the world. So uh, this is a rare, very rare th feat, as we all know, um, doing something like this that simultaneously both simplifies but also increases explanatory accuracy and depth. So uh, I was super impressed um, by, by the, even the possibility of doing something like that in this context. Um, so with the remaining time that I have, what I want to do is, <clears throat> as I mentioned, uh, really focus on some possible extensions and spinoffs that are um, uh, just basically my reactions on what could be exciting to pursue uh, you know, for myself, for you two, for anyone in the audience. Um, uh, basically using what you have, the sort of impressive thing that you've built here and maybe uh, going in different directions with it. And, and the first um, uh, direction that I thought would be super exciting kind of based on uh, some of the sort of research that, that I do myself is along the lines of public opinion. So you've taken an incredibly great amount of care and I imagine a huge amount of work to delineate the different dimensions of citizen rights. Um, oh, I should say uh, sort of a, as a preface to this in, in these possible extensions of spin-offs. I'm gonna focus um, primarily in the context of immigrant rights in the contemporary era for, for reasons of, of um, you know, the focus of, of this series. Uh, so as I mentioned, a lot of work obviously went into delineating uh, the different dimensions of citizenship rights uh, and mapping those to concrete policy items in the immigration space. Uh, and this has obviously served you very well in the context of the book, but I can see this as potentially being valuable for public opinion scholars as well, right? So survey uh, and survey question design is really hard. Um, and often what people like to do is create batteries of questions that map onto different constructs rather than uh, identify what is the single most important question. Uh, and the framework that you've developed, uh, as far as I can see, uh, can be a really valuable foundation for doing just that. That is take the items or subset of them that you use to score states on the inclusionary exclusionary spectrum with respect to the different dimensions and then modify them into survey questions that are, would essentially measure individual voters support for opposition to these policy items, right? And this, uh, to me, would be really interesting and exciting in a number of different ways. So sort of uh, at the uh, simplest, um, but still very useful level, you could see to what extent voters' attitudes, you know, first of all, what are voters' attitudes and the extent to which 
they cohere with what their states are doing. Uh, but in addition to that, I could see there being lots of really cool opportunities to um, do things like apply unsupervised learning tasks on these sorts of data. So as an example, um, you know, using factor analysis or some other latent variable model to see to what extent voters view of citizenship rights actually is along the same lines of the conceptual map that you lay out, right? There, I think there are reasons to expect um, that, that, that this would be the case, but there are also reasons to expect that it might not be the case. And I think there, there's something really interesting theoretically there. Another example would be to do something like use cluster analysis to see if there are any broad patterns that might classify voters into different types, you know, defined by specific bundles of rights th that they support beyond simply distinguishing people who are generally inclusionary versus generally exclusionary. So and those are just you know, very, it's two very uh, minor examples of, uh, of what could, could happen here, but there's just lots that I find um, that could be really interesting going in the direction of basically modifying some of what you have into the public opinion realm. Uh, the second um, uh, sort of reaction and, and uh, idea I had was to um, kind of build on this to distinguish between the importance of normative versus instrumental motivations behind states' decisions uh, to progress or regress, right? So the book uh, primarily focuses on enabling features like constitutional opportunities, congressional action, presidential action, social movements, and of course the players involved, um, whether that be uh, immigrant rights groups or legislative champions at the state level um, that is focusing on who's driving things, how are they how are they able to do what they did, and of course what were they able to do. Um, what it does a little bit less, and this is not meant to be a critique at all because it's I think it was out of this uh, largely out of the scope of the, of the project, but what it did a little bit less on was um, go into depth on uh, kind of unpacking the motivating features that convinced collective holes to go along in either direction. So another way to think about this is, um, what were uh, or what have been the winning arguments that seem to convince uh, not only individual groups, but kind of lawmakers as a whole or the body politic of, of overarching states to either progress or regress, right? How do you actually get a sufficient critical mass of lawmakers, foundations, voters, groups, everyone involved to actually get stuff on the books uh, behind this? And, and at a high level, I think we might think of uh, there being two classes of motivations. The first uh, might be what we could call normative or moral motivations for, relate to the idea of, uh, about human rights, dignity, fairness, and, and related concepts that is treat people a certain way because that's what they deserve on a moral or, or normative basis. And then the second class of motivations would be economic or instrumental, which relate to ideas about how the granting or elimination of certain rights will uh, potentially affect broader society, where I think in this uh, context, a lot of focus is probably placed on things like economic impacts and public safety impacts. And so as one uh, very concrete example of this that you, that you um, uh, touched on in the presentation and, and speak about quite a bit in the book, uh, let's take the decision of certain states to grant driver's licenses to undocumented immigrants. And so this can be, and indeed in public discourses and policy materials has been advocated for on the basis of both classes of motivations, right? On the normative side, it's about the right to movement, allowing for independence and dignity. And on the instrumental side, it's about allowing for a subpopulation of people who are known to be contributing to the economy to actually and efficiently contribute to the economy, as well as to facilitate public safety gains in the way of driver training and tests associated with licenses and, and the ability to get auto insurance, which you know, helps everyone involved. Um, and so I'm, I'm personally curious, not only in the case of driver's licenses, but more broadly across all these dimensions about the extent to which uh, these different motivations are winning the day. Clearly both are at play, um, but you know, are there ways to think about whether uh, one is more important in different cases or are they playing different roles entirely and actually getting things uh, pushed, pushed um, onto the books, right? Um, I, I don't think I have much time, but maybe I'll just touch a little bit briefly on, on a couple other things, but be a little bit more succinct and I'd be happy to share my thoughts in more detail with you, Alan and Karthik uh, later. But um, another idea was the extent to which there are interstate dynamics at play. And what I, let me explain what I mean by that. So on the one hand, we see states making decisions to deviate from the federal baseline. Uh, and, and a state might be doing that simply because that state's preferences, for whatever reason, are different from the baseline. So all states, uh, seen from that perspective, might be reacting to the same types of opportunities and on the basis of the same you know, so, sorts of social movements to achieve their own ideal points to the extent possible. On the other hand, uh, there at least a, seems to be on the surface, if you look at uh, certain public officials, um, certain public officials' uh, public statements, 
almost an element of interstate reaction, whether it be em emulation or negative reaction. The contrast between, between California and Arizona, at least at the surface, it seems to be particularly present in this area. Uh, right? So is it the case that states might actually be trying to not simply deviate from the federal baseline, uh, but to expressly counterbalance each other? Another way to think about this is, uh, to what extent are states' preferences in terms of how much they want to deviate from the federal baseline, not simply an internal function, but also a function of what other states are doing. This is, I admit, very conjectural and a bit theoretical, but um, you know, something that's, that, that felt interesting in, in my own mind. And then very briefly, uh, I wonder to what extent um, similar sorts of concepts and, and the, the same sort of framework that you have applied here could apply um, in the immigration context as well to other federalist countries. Um, uh, whether it be Germany that also has a, a state structure or, or Australia or, or a federal structure at the province level like Canada. It'd be interesting to see how similar dynamics have or have not developed in those countries. And to the extent that they have not would serve, or, uh, serve to, I think, further elucidate the enabling conditions that are unique to the United States, right? And with their unique constitutional features in the US beyond the federalist, um, the federalist structure. Um, and my final question, which, which you already touched on Karthik, uh, which, which I think is sort of on everyone's mind is what's going to happen moving forward. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, again, thank you so much for the opportunity to, to comment on this. I really enjoyed, uh, really enjoyed the book. Well, thank you for those incisive remarks. Kirk, um, Alan and Karthik, would you like to take a moment to respond to one or two of those points? Um, I'll start and then kick it over to Alan. Uh, thank you, Kirk. And this is, um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it, it it's great that the feedback was was amazing. And I think, you know, our hope was, I mean, I think given, given you know, what we wanted to do is to, I think, um, help set the stage of how to conceptualize and measure some of these things and to essentially show plausibly that it, that, that it does explain what's going on in the world. And then, uh, you know, the, the part where we, and, and there's a, just so much kind of historical work um, and kind of complex causality here that we were, um, you know, we were a bit hesitant to have like kind of like a kind of, you know, one kind of elegant thing about what are the drivers that, that do this, but certainly, you know, we leave it up to others. And I think for, I mean, I, I you know, my background is in political behavior and public opinion. So, you know, either you, Kirk or others, I would love to be part of some collaborative project and, and, and Alan does too, of, being able to convert these two batteries to then um, to then um, understand both descriptively and then potentially you know down the road to typologize and then to do other things with it that would be exciting so um, you know if if your game or others are game we would love to be part of teams that that do that work you know in terms of the I'll just say a little bit about the interstate dynamics at play absolutely you know kind of diffusion or maybe reactions, uh, kind of backlash kind of dynamics, wanting to differentiate from neighboring states, all of those things absolutely are at play. They're not in our uh, model per se, but I would also add, you know, you also have dynamics between localities and states, right? So for example, Texas passing preempting legislation to, to wipe out what Austin is trying to do, right? California had a version of that when you had cities like Escondido, right, closer, closer to home in San Diego um, that had passed a landlord ordinance and then Governor Schwarzenegger um, signed a bill that preempted the ability of localities from putting those restrictions on the books. So, um, but yes, I think if we, if we think of US states similar to countries and the kinds of dynamics, interstate dynamics and the kind of comparative thing, absolutely, right? we can and should do that. So thank you for flagging that. Yeah, I'll just echo, uh, I think the, the comments are spot on and, and thanks for, for all of those comments. Um, uh, I guess for the, the, the kind of normative versus instrumental public opinion design, I think that that would be really a great way, not just for scholarship, but also the, the activism side of, of the work that we're doing. Uh, just understanding how do you frame these things and also how, how does the movement understand what it's doing uh, in each of the states and, and to do that more strategically. Uh, so I think that there's a lot of, a lot of potential there um, for, for that to grow. Um, and then in terms of, uh, I, I would say that 
the interstate dynamics and also the intrastate dynamics in, in federalism, uh, I think one of the things that does stand out is just by centering social movements in our framework. Um, I, th I think it's pretty clear that movement building and capacity is still really important, uh, more so often than kind of a diff diffusion explanation, uh, although th those factors are all there. Um, and so like, yeah, it is very complex causal process <laughs> or mechanism and there's so many different types of mechanisms at work. Um, and we just try to, do, to, to ground that uh, more so how I situate myself as a scholar, as an APD scholar. So really kind of leaning heavily on the institutions and the movements and the relationships over time. Um, but there are lots of different ways of, of kind of unpacking this. Um, and it's great to hear about like the, the public safety and economic arguments and things like that, that, that helps connect what we're doing to a lot of the scholarship uh, that is happening in, in immigration setting right now. Okay, terrific. Well, we already have several questions. So let's begin with a question from uh, Marian Feldblum, who offers some information about her work on um, higher education and immigrant students, um, particularly around undocumented students with a question. I'm interested in how and or if you both think we can engage higher education institutions to think about their role in advancing these policies, perhaps in terms of advancing components of citizenship or basic rights. Absolutely. So, we, you know, in the book, we talk about advocacy coalitions, right? And, you know, to, for people who want to say, what matters more, social movements or political parties? And we're like, yes, both of them matter, right? And so it's not, so you're not going to find that where we say, oh, you know, really, once a party gets a hold of something, they can just like tear through it and get whatever they want to have done, or the vice versa is that, you can get all the legislative support you want, but if you don't have a social movement that's laying the groundwork for something to be able to push it, none of this is going to happen. And so we, you know, we rely, I mean, it's, it's more of a framework. It's not, I mean, to some extent you say, well, if you're able to build these coalitions that include social movement actors, higher ed, you can think of them, some of them could be social movement actors, but, you know, there's civil society actors of different ways. You can think of them potentially as interest groups too, right? Um, as well as allies within government all coming together. So absolutely higher ed institutions and leaders have an important role to play and they have played an important role uh, in the past, not only when it comes to advocacy on state ex expansions on rights at the state level, but also expansions on rights um, at the federal level. Um, Alan, I, I don't know if you wanna add anything to that. I'll just briefly highlight that. I mean, definitely, uh college and university campuses are a really important space uh, for youth and the youth part of the movements. Um, and I mean, there's the current push right now to uh, ban protesting activities, both at, uh, in some colleges and universities and also just statewide. Uh, and so I think that that kind of echoes the 1970s, 80s environment. And I think that that is important to the movement part of this story. Uh, and so certainly, uh, and I think that the, the work that's happening there with Miriam's work at the national level is an important way of maybe connecting the threads between national, state, and local. Um, and so, uh, and that goes beyond just the, the education rights that are in dimension three of our framework. Okay, we have a live question from Hiroshi Motomura. Hi, uh, congratulations, by the way. I really look forward to, to, to reading the book. Um, and maybe you answer this question, but I'll ask it anyway. It ties into Kirk's concluding question about, about federalism and the role of states. And I guess it's, it's, in some sense, it's not a question that you can fully answer because it's about what you see in the future. Um, but here's where, here's where I, I'm really curious. I mean, you devote most of today's presentation to defining state citizenship. And you, know, you talk about how state citizenship might expand or contract in the future, how it might evolve. But, but my question really goes to what is the role of state citizenship? Because it seems to me you, you tell two stories, or what I'm hearing could be heard as two different stories of state citizenship. One story is that state citizenship is a zone of contest over national citizenship. And so the point of reference there is always that, you know, people try to do things in California because they think there should be a federal law that allows driver's licenses for the undocumented or whatever it may be. It's, it's the state of citizenship is the zone of contest over national citizenship. And the other story is that state citizenship is is really a zone of independence from national citizenship, that state citizenship in this story is 
hyper-federalist, that it's pre-secessionist or even semi-secessionist. And the future is something more like what you see in the European Union. Um, so I guess it really boils down to, you know, where do you see this headed in the coming decades or generations? Um, how will this question be answered? Um, or, but feel free to tell me that the question doesn't matter. Well, Hiroshi, thank you for a uh, great question. You know, part of it, I think, will depend on what happens with the Biden administration and the Newsom administration, for example. Let's just take the state of California, right? And I, 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 remember, I, I think, I, I don't know if I was talking, I think I was talking to a reporter and they were talking about the border, the border crisis, you know, what's going on at the border and you know, how, how California is going to handle this. And with, with Kamala Harris being tasked to go there, formally being attorney general here, what should we expect? And I was like, yeah, actually, when she was attorney general, California was fighting with the Obama administration on enforcement issues. And right now things are kind of quiet, but um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. You know, will, will the federal government accommodate? I think so part of that is over, it's not a, just a general question, but kind of the particular dynamics of not only what parties are in the White House and in a particular state, but even the kind of understanding, it makes a difference to have Harris there, right? As opposed to when the Obama administration was there, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Hiroshi, because I think you were part of some of these conversations. It didn't seem like there were many people in the White House that were very sympathetic to what California was trying to do in terms of expansion of rights. So I think that it is, at least now it seems given the number of California people, including Secretary Becerra and Health and Human Services, that it could be more of the former where California is the early adopter and starts infusing things into the administration. Um, so th that, that would be my initial take on it, um, that uh, at least things seem to be heading for states like California more in that direction. Now, I don't know what states like Texas and others would, would think of that. Right. Um, I mean, they will continue to sue and they'll try to use the courts to uh, to try to move things in a different direction. Uh, but things could turn sideways. Right. Thing. So it could be that, um, you know, as we get closer to the midterms or to uh, to the next presidential election, there will be an increasing push to try to crack down. So that, that would be my initial take in the immigration context on this question. I'll just, uh, and I think it's a, I mean, it's a really important, great question. Um, I will kind of frame it a little bit more historically and theoretically. Uh, I, I, I see it like the role of state citizenship more as, as changing depending on, 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 on uh, progress. So before legal status is given at the national level, so before a federal baseline is actually there, that is any way progressive on rights, um, then I see it more as a zone of, of contest. Um, so before the 14th Amendment, it was clearly a, a zone of contest. Uh, today, California is clearly a zone of contest. Um, and, and then I, I see it shifting and becoming more complex towards a progressive federalism understanding of its role, uh, where it builds on top and continues to push uh, what is possible in, in, in expanding on constitutional and federal rights. Um, and so, uh, and I don't know where that will, constitutionally, the question around immigration is also different from, from the question of the African-American experience. So um, then it becomes uh, about just once you have, uh, once you naturalize, and once you have access to those constitutional protections, um, there's gonna be a different, uh, more complex, relationship or, or role for state citizenship to play. But I think, just, yeah. Oh, go ahead, oh, Well, I just want to just observe that maybe, I mean, maybe it was in my question that we really don't know the answer to this yet. I mean, I can imagine answer, asking this question in 1858, uh, is this a zone of contest over national citizenship or is a pre-secessionist? And one might have said it in 1858 or 1850 that it's, oh, it's just a contest, a zone of contest over national citizenship. And you give a very different answer in 1861. So I, I, I mean, I just, I just want to highlight this as a dimension. It, you know, it reminds me of what uh, the former Chinese premier John Lai said about the French Revolution and its effect. 
uh, in the in the 1970s, he said, "Well, we really don't know yet." <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, the thing the thing I wanted to add, Hiroshi, is that um, this might all. I mean, of course, given given the potential for conflict under federalism, it's it's always there. But I also want to, and and this this might sound like kind of way out there, but I remember hearing a spoken word artist talking about what it means to be a Californian, right? And I think we can honor that even outside of this kind of conflictual space. And that's something I think, and, and even though in the book, we, 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 we set aside the question of local citizenship. We also point out that states can pretty much do whatever they want with localities and they have in the past. And the court is essentially states have a uh, certain set of powers in, in our constitutional framework the way localities don't. But that said, we could see a powerful expansion of, you know, what does it mean to be an Angelino? And what are the kind of rights we want to build regardless of what, you know, we're pushing the Biden administration or Congress to do? Um, and so I'm hoping that that, it kind of, it, 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 of course, what you're talking about is, is this, is this kind of, preview of things to come or is it you know is it setting up conflict let's also just see it for what it is and the impact that it has in our communities and how meaningful it could be i'll just briefly add one last thing is it, it gets to the attention of your the works you draw you know, the attention you draw out on in your books is what states can do to restrict or regress versus progress um and i think i mean ideally uh, you would want uh in the immigration context for federal preemption of bad laws and federal support of good laws. And, and then similarly in the like African-American citizen context, you would want the same uh, where progress can be made at state levels. Okay, so we have a question from Heather Stewart who begins by observing the right to belong with rights and access to justice are demanded from those who are otherwise. Black and brown advocates point out that citizenship as experienced by black Americans does not protect them from government sanctioned denial of rights or maltreatment. While undocumented immigrants continue to fight for legal status, there's a recognition that citizenship does not protect them from discrimination or marginalization. What does this mean for the concepts of the different types of citizenships and rights available to citizens? So we, uh, we talk about the meaningful provision of these rights, right? We'd say the provision of the rights, but we talk about the meaningful provision of these rights. So we kind of skirt the question of access to rights, I, I suppose. But because one one thing you can just say is we're mostly looking at laws that they're passed and a little bit at implementation. But you know, just especially in our empirical work, I mean, those that in like each one of our chapters could be a book, <laughs> you know, if, if we if we had the resources to do it. So that brings up a, an important question, right? So if you, if if you have laws that that do not, uh, you know, explicitly discriminate, uh, nor can you find kind of other kinds of implementation rules that are clearly laid out, um, where you can point to uh, discrimination in in the application of those rights, how can we talk about um, differential access or provision of those rights? Uh, I'll turn it over to Alan. I mean, Alan, I really want to credit him for kind of the deep, the deep historical work to do this. But it's it's tough to just be in this kind of positivist framework of provision of rights and not explicitly acknowledging that different groups will have different access to those rights. We try to say that it's differential provision of those rights. But Alan, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. I'll just briefly add that uh, in the conceptual chapter, we, I mean, the positivist part is to, to separate what we're doing from like the, the, the approach of capturing lived experiences or the approach of ca capturing the impact uh, and the differential impact of policy and access to policy. So we're not including that purposely in our book just to be concise of what we're, do we're doing. And I think that, that there's a lot more room for that type of work to be in conversation with, with what we're doing. Similar to what Kirk had suggested, it could be based on public opinion and that could become positivist in some ways. It can be also uh, ethnographic uh, interviews and, and kind of based on different types of jurisdictions and, and policy environments. So um, I think that there's a lot of conversations to be made between the questions you're asking and 
and, and our framework. Okay, we have another question that in some ways synthesizes two of Kirk's questions, the comparative question about other federalist systems and the interactions among the US states. Uh, the, the different version here is coming from Fernando Villegas who says, in my dissertation project, I explore why urban citizenship develops in progressive cities, both in Mexico and the US. Uh, to what extent can you apply your framework at the city level in countries with similar immigration federal systems such as Mexico? And then here's the new wrinkle. Um, have you considered the transnational effects of pro-immigration policies in your framework? That is how progressive policies and legislation in California are influencing policies in other countries. Hmm. Well, we're not, we don't do that in our book, <laughs> but that is, that is great. I mean, this is, um, you know, people have talked about the right to the city, for example, and how I think it can, it can work the other way as well. Um, right. And in fact, a fair amount of, I would say the imagination and the courage um, of immigrant rights activists comes from what they have seen possible in other places and asking why not here. So I think it can go both ways, but um, Alan, I don't know if you have. Yeah, so we, we're not looking at the international uh, like institutions or movement uh, opportunities and, and things like that. Um, but I will say that uh, in the US context for my second book, I look at the, the 1980s and the, the sanctuary movement that emerges here in the US. Um, and there are important distinctions between like what is happening at the international level with the sanctuary movement and then also what is fueling the particular city level policies that are sanctuary. Um, but there's a complex relationship between those two things. So domestic and international. Um, and we can, there's, there's also a really complex relationship with abolition when it comes to the international abolitionist movement uh, and then also the US domestic one. Um, so the federated movement historical work is already complicated enough. And so we kind of skirted the, the international one, but that's an important kind of puzzle in itself is teasing out when that, when that becomes viable uh, and important. To, and in the 1980s, it was certainly what helped spark and gain traction for those movements, not just for the moral messaging, um, but for other reasons. So when thinking about the causes of policy and how they might spread across jurisdiction, what, what is the role of the academy in this diffusion? And I'm not saying at a normative level, what should the role of the academy be? I'm, I'm asking what empirically do you think has been the, the role of academics, if anything, in the development of these kinds of state level citizenship compacts and changes? Alan, you can take this one and I can go after it if you want. Um. I'll process the question after you. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, there, there's some academics like Peter Markowitz in, in New York who, you know, actually helped write the New Yorker's home law. Turns out, I mean, it was sometimes be careful what you do as an academic because it was a it was a great kind of expansive notion of what state citizenship could be, and it builds on his scholarship and that it included voting rights, it included rights to driver's licenses, healthcare, et cetera. And and actually, so, I mean, to Kirk's point, I mean, is the public ready for it? The public, at least through their representatives in uh, the New York uh, state legislature was not ready for it. It was way too exotic, put together as a package. It just didn't, it didn't fly at all. That said, right, there are um, academics in, uh, in law clinics, like in, in New Haven, right? And, 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 California and, and UCLA and, and many other places, um, labor centers that are that are doing that work of advancing and expanding rights, especially worker rights and immigrant rights that I think are really, really critical. Then there's that kind of next layer of academic work where comparative scholarship, absolutely, right? I mean, I would say even for California, right? to be able to look across in, in different jurisdictions and different countries to be able to then say, why not do this here? And then finally, I would say this is also for historians too, right? So for historians who can say, listen, there's these rights expansions, they've, they've happened before in the United States. It's happened before in many of these other states or restrictions. Let's California feel like puff our chest too much. It's like, 
for 150 years, we found all sorts of ways to oppress our populations. And we were talking about, there's a lot of recognition now of the 1875 Page Act. It's like California was doing a whole lot to oppress their Chinese populations before the US government ever got to it. So um, absolutely, I think uh, th there is a role uh, uh, there, but in terms of, David, I mean, I think there, there's more that could be done. I think there's a lot of myopia when it comes to uh, policymakers and even intellectuals in terms of what they think is possible or impossible uh, in, in terms of rights expansion. And I think there's more that could be done. I'll just, I'll add very briefly, but I think it's really important uh, to think through how the concepts we use and the terms we use actually mm -hmm. provide meaning uh, and create and construct meaning. So, uh, and that's one of the things that we, I think, that's one of the motivations of the book is, is just rethinking citizenship as not an us, them uh, binary and, and so simplified uh, in, in, in a way that otherizes uh, different populations and groups. Um, so I think that that's really important. And uh, even in terms of explanation, so the way that demographics are used as an argument uh, or to understand different patterns in, in, in policy making and, and things like that, um, that it doesn't get attached accidentally as, as the fault of immigrant populations. Um, and so the, the scholarship and the concepts and, and variables and things that we use uh, have a lot of power. And, and I think that that's uh, something that we need to consider um, and can always be improved. You know, I just want to give the opportunity also if, um, if Kirk you know, is on the panel or any, any of the other panelists, uh, anybody else on the call wants to jump in here with uh, with reactions um and while we wait for that if for alan and uh, and karthik if there are any of the other comments that kirk made you didn't have a chance to respond to yet that you would like to to take a moment to respond to now yeah i mean i um actually so i'd be curious kirk because you ran out of time you know if you know in terms of i would like love to hear your thoughts about kind of moving forward what um, you know? Would you see kind of the realm of either what is possible or probable, and not just in terms of expansion, maybe contraction too, on some of these rights? Yeah, I mean, th this is, I think, where uh, to me some of the public opinion research would be, be really interesting because I think sort of as 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 you guys were just talking about, but I, I can also see where uh, some of this might not be known yet if there have haven't been serious public opinion efforts along all these different dimensions is the extent to the extent that public uh, opinion is not fully aligned with either what's on the books right now or what um, uh, might be looming down the agenda on the agenda later um, that could lead to different types of backlash um, that would then um, I think could cause entrenchment um, or, or, or lead to you know, sort of unpredictable uh, movements of regression that you know, obviously are packed into all sorts of different complicated dynamics, whether you're talking about sub-state um, uh, sub dynamics as well, or, or interstate reaction uh, between each other. And uh, I think, you know, one thing I would be very curious about is, is trying to understand, um, it, it, are there any sorts of patterns um, across the geography of the U.S. Um, that are uh, either correlated or predictive of where um, public opinion is more or less aligned with uh, things that are actually happening on on the uh, on the legislative side. Um, I don't necessarily have any particular uh, particularly coherent theoretical priors on on this, but I could imagine there could be reasons why in certain places, either on a regional basis or on the basis of of demographics or on the basis of where states are ideologically that there could be places where there's more of a discrepancy between what voters are feeling and what um, uh, what's actually being done by policymakers or yeah. social movements in, in those places. I mean, to me, this is, I mean, this, what's so fascinating to me in California is, right, essentially two decades after Prop 187, mm -hmm. you've, you've seen such a kind of robust multi-dimensional set of laws that have been passed in the legislature that largely have held up 
I mean, California has the referendum process, which is different from the initiative where voters, they don't like any legislation that they've passed. And we saw that with Prop 22 and AB5, right? I mean, that was the, uh, that was the law on gig workers and there was a lot of money behind it. And maybe that's the thing. There needs to be a ton of capital behind it. And maybe generally major capital in California is generally okay with all of these laws that were passed. And so they didn't kind of mount the kind of thing to do it. But in some states like in Oregon, the first time they passed driver license expansion, it did go up to a referendum and it, and it, and it got defeated, right? And so that's, but to me, th those are like the cautionary tales and, but exceptional ones. In most cases, the public is kind of unaware of most of these laws. And I think on the flip of it, you have progressive politicians. This is one of the things in California, when you look at the sheer number of laws and still that continue to be think, it just shows you how much US citizenship matters. It affects so many aspects of life, right? From one's professional life to education, um, in so many different dimensions that what the absence of comprehensive immigration reform at the national level has done or citizenship at the national level has done is provided plenty of entrepreneurial opportunities for progressive state legislators in California to pass a whole bunch. And it's not, that's another, I think, advantage of this incremental approach to immigration reform, if you will. And that's something that Alan and I have done in other context is that you give different legislators, you know, different things that can claim credit for, right? At the same time, the public isn't seeing this as like one big thing that's gonna threaten uh, what they're doing, but there are some laws. So the so-called uh, state sanctuary law, right? That, uh, is it, was it SB 56? I'm forgetting the title, the, the number of it, but um, but uh, Kevin DeLeon's law, you know, you had, you have revolts especially in Southern California. You have these jurisdictions that were, that were um, trying to sue to not be subject to, um, to the provisions of that law. That was the California Values Act, right? Um, but ultimately they didn't succeed. But yes, I think absolutely paying attention, at least I think of public opinion as a, largely as a constraint rather than a driver of policy, um, except when you have politicians like Donald Trump and others who are able to activate, mobilize, and even shift opinion over time. But even then, they reach their limits in terms of how much they can harness public opinion to, to uh, enact policy. This is where I think the advocacy coalition approach seems to make more sense and that public opinion will matter in terms of when you've gone too far like like Oregon did on driver's licenses, they didn't, it, it takes movement work to shape public opinion in the first place to be able to make sure that new things that you're adding is not a shock to the system as it were, and that people end up rejecting it through the political process. Mm -hmm. But Alan, I don't know if you have additional thoughts on that. Uh, I mean, I, one of the things I think that are, is really interesting to me is is the way that maybe public opinion can be used to understand like federalism uh, events or conflicts that emerge, like movement events, so like BLM happening last year, how these might change uh, the strategic environment across the dimensions. And so I think that there's, I mean, there's a lot of great work that can be done that that builds up and, and just really becomes more strategic in, in the movement way um, across the different levels. Yeah, that's a great point, Alan. Um, I mean, I think mostly we've been talking about immigrant rights here, but if you talk about Black Lives Matter and what that has meant uh, nationally and in different states, and this is where, you know, I lean on some other work and Kurt, you suggested this as well when you're thinking about kind of motivators and drivers, think about framing, right? So if you're talking about justice reinvestment or reimagining justice, that's one thing. But if you say defund the police, it might be the exact same policy, but the way you frame it can produce varying reactions that make certain policies more likely or less likely to happen. Um, and so, I mean, David, I think that's also a role for academics to play is maybe to, um, to help guide you know, movement actors kind of with expertise and framing and, and public opinion. Now that said, of course, something like defund the police 
still plays an important role for movement activists that, you know, that can't get fired up about reimagining public safety or justice reinvestment. They, you know, they're going to stick with defund the police because that's what's going to uh, get them out the door and, you know, um, through thick and thin to, to push a policy. But yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, we've been talking mostly in the realm of of uh, immigrants and their citizenship rights, but if we think of black people and their citizenship rights or, or native folks or queer folks and their citizenship rights, um, we just sketch out the possibilities here, but, but that is something that I, we're both hopeful that folks can think about citizenship rights in a more expansive way and not just in the immigrant context, um, because we certainly see in the United States, but. Uh, but even in other parts of the world, especially in terms of queer folks and trans folks um, and, and their rights and how they're constantly under, under challenge and, and under threat. Well, thank you very much. There's a, a lot on the table. There's a lot of more important research to be done. And, and collectively, you've not only shared your own research, but you really laid out a research agenda. And I know there are a lot of people on the call who were working on dissertations and, and also thinking about next projects. So, I think this has been a really generative discussion. Um, I'd like to join you um, in our seminar next week if you're if you're able to be with us as well. Um, we'll have Richard Alba and discussant Susan Brown discussing Richard Alba's new book, uh, The Great Demographic Illusion, Majority Minority in the Expanding American Mainstream. Uh, Sophia is uh, sharing the links to all of our events that we're hosting between UCLA and uh, CCIS over the rest of the academic year. So hope to see you then and, uh, and have a good week. Thank you everyone. Thank you.